I'm so excited that we have Innovate Digital Solutions as a sponsor of HeCast this season. Innovate Digital Solutions provides anything that an office might need, hardware, software, IT, copy machines, things like that. They make an office run more smooth and they're really good at it. But one of the things that I love about Innovate, their founders, Andre and Katia Brasso, they're people that don't just believe it's important to build a strong business, but also to take that success and build a strong community around them. They really have a heart for what He Changed It is doing. People they love have gone through some of the stuff that we talk about on this show. Andre and Katia both believe that you can build a life worth living, and there are these evidence-based solutions that can help build that life. We're so excited to be in partnership with Innovate Digital Solutions, and He Changed It is better for it, and we hope you will be too. Go to innovate.ca and check them out. Welcome to HeCast, the official podcast of He Changed It. As always, I am Mike Chisholm. As always, I am excited to be here and be a part of um, the conversations around He Changed It, the men's mental wellness app. Go to hechangedit.com and uh, check out the app. Download it for free. Uh, they've got both links, uh, hechangedit.com, or it's in both app stores, both the uh, the Googles and the Apples of the world. And um, here, I, this is a cool episode here because we have uh, a New York Times bestselling author on. And it's a New York Times bestselling author who has been a significant part of the hip hop community, deeply entrenched in the hip hop community since uh, maybe not its inception, but just shortly after. I mean, started as a DJ. Rob Kenner started as a DJ for these house parties back in the day where it was all vinyl and these MCs would get together in the late 80s, um, you know, talking about, uh, uh, you know, being there at the ground floor and, and watching this movement start to grow. Also a journalist, though. And so when Vibe magazine started, he was there at the very beginning all the way till the very end when all the magazines of the world started collapsing and whatnot. Unfortunately, Vibe, uh, also a part of that, has written many things, many groundbreaking things in the world of hip hop from articles uh, to essays, uh, all sorts of different pieces and books. Look at this. The Marathon Don't Stop, The Life and Times of Nipsey Hussle. That is Rob's book, uh, best-selling book on the New York Times. This is a phenomenal story. Uh, Rob comes here to HeCast today to talk about this, but also his vantage point in what he has seen in his life um, and, 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 and rises and falls of different industries, different uh, parts of hip-hop and, and what it has turned into. We have a really cool conversation. He shares some of the things that he has learned along the way. Uh, yes, we we talk a lot about hip hop. We talk about Tupac and Biggie and some of these other things that he was a part of, but it's way deeper than that. It's more than just the sensational stuff. Uh, it really goes right to the heart. He cast the official podcast of He Changed It. Very, very, very proud to present our conversation with Rob Kenner. <laughs> Rob, I am so grateful uh, that you have taken time out of, of, of your schedule to come on HeCast today. Thank you very, very much for, uh, for giving us your time and uh, what will be uh, for a great conversation. Happy to be here, Mike. Thanks for the invite. Oh, it's so exciting, and I got so many things um, I want to talk to you about. The last time Candy and I were in New York, I uh, was there for a Letterman thing, and we ended up we ended up being able to connect in that in that uh, wonderful little coffee shop there. And and yeah. I mean, I I could talk to you forever about hip hop, uh -huh. and uh, you have such an interesting vantage point. Before we get into any of that stuff, I need to ask you: Have you seen the Bob Marley movie yet? And if you have, what did you think of it? Yeah, I thought it was great. I mean, you know. Someone like Bob Marley that you have seen countless interviews and live film, you know, footage of, of the actual Robert Nesta Marley is always challenging to bring that kind of a iconic figure to the screen with an actor and a scripted piece. But I think the actor did a great job and, um, you know, there's always parts of the story that especially people who are really immersed in his life, you know, would like to see more uh, of this or more of that. And there's definitely a lot of stories and subplots that were not included in the film. But um, I think what is there is solid. And, you know, uh, I'm glad that it finally came to the screen. This is a film that's been in the works for like 20 years. I think there, were, there was talk of uh, a, a version coming out when um, Lauren Hill did that uh, 
great duet with Bob Marley, the Turn Your Lights Down Low, produced by Stephen Marley. Um, and, you know, so at that time, I think those conversations were going on. So it's been a long time coming, and congratulations to the Marley family for having the number one movie in America, and I think it's over 100 million worldwide. So, yep. you know, the people definitely wanted to, to see that. Oh, yeah. I, I Well, and, and I'll tell you this. Um, it was so funny watching the demographic of people when Candy and I went to go see it. It was so funny looking at the demographic of people who had come to see it. Because don't get me wrong, there were there were younger people there, uh, mm -hmm. no question. But there were a lot of baby boomers there. There were yeah. a lot of people who and, – and, and it was funny because as they're getting into some of the uh, the politically charged, polarized – parts especially of the movie where there's where there's you know clearly one side versus another not a lot of room in the middle for 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 things there's there's poor bob marley there in the middle of it yeah. um it sure reminds you I, I i listened to some of the reactions of some of these some of these women and, and men in the audience who could be my parents mm. and it's almost like there is an actual uh, energetic desire to get rid of some of this polarization like the movie itself came out at a time where boy we sure need a bob marley type figure to help try and unite people it seems to have been released at the right time for that yeah yeah i mean unity is a very uh fleeting concept these days you know um but it takes heroic people like a bob marley or a nipsey hustle to throw themselves mm -hmm. into the breach and try to bring the, the different tribes together. And it's easier said than done, for sure. It's easier to divide people than to unite them, it seems, sadly. Yeah, and it seems that there's business in it, unfortunately. There's business in, in getting people all tribalized up and, 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 and on a side. And, you know, whether it's your technology, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Apple, oh, no, I'm Google, and, and, and mine's better, and mine's better. And it just seems to be that, uh, that there are people who, who, who really get a charge out of getting people excited about rivalry and um at the end of the day you know you bring up nipsey uh we might as well get into it right now so there it is right there still yeah. out there the marathon don't stop the life and times of nipsey hustle um you know I, I i don't know how many other minds in this world uh are are more educated or greater than yours or or, or at the same level as yours when it comes to the world of hip-hop uh vibe magazine forever right up to the very end you know this 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 mark that you have made in the in the hip-hop world in so many different ways why was nipsey's the story that uh got turned into a book like this i mean obviously you did some other stuff with tupac and, and some of the other docs that you did the dilla soul doc and things what was the, the 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 part about nipsey that just had you captivated enough that yeah this is going to be the first book yeah I, it's a Great question. I mean, um, during my years at Vibe, I worked as the editorial director of Vibe Books. So we did the book Tupac Shakur. We we um, published a book called Unbelievable, which was about Christopher Wallace, also known as the Notorious B.I.G., and that mm -hmm. became the film Notorious. Um, so you know, those were some of the stories that I worked on, you know, under the Vibe umbrella, but. Yeah. Um, the Marathon Don't Stop is the first book that I've written on my own. And yeah. um, it is really just a book that I felt needed to be done because I had the, the pleasure and the honor of getting to know Nipsey over a period of time. And I was acutely aware of how uh, underappreciated he was during his lifetime. Um, and, you know, going all the way back really to the first time we met at Vibe Magazine up through the launch of um, his solo debut, um, Victory Lap, which, you know, mm -hmm. it's crazy to think that was his debut because he put out so much music, uh, but he did that as independent mixtapes. I was going to say mixtapes on the streets, essentially the street level, kind of how hip hop sort of started back in the day. And we can get into that in a minute here, right? Like that was exactly 50 Cent, same, same, same sort of thing. 50 Cent was already a big underground star before any label kind of came calling at that point. A lot of, lot, of, lot of stuff out there already at that point. Yeah, and I think a big part of why Nipsey didn't want to put out a, it wasn't that there weren't labels who wanted to work with him, but he was not able to compromise his business uh, principles. And you know, he, he refused to sell himself short. 
So, you know, uh, the mixtapes and the success of those mixtapes and the innovative things he did to market projects like Crenshaw and Mailbox Money uh, gave him the leverage to dictate terms that were less uh, exploitive than the usual major label contract. So anyway, um, for a number of reasons, Nipsey's movement was uh, not widely known to people that were already tapped in. He, he never sought to be the most famous person in the world. He wanted to have maximum integrity and maximum impact on the people who were really rocking with him. So you know, I felt that there was a need for a book to explain his brilliance and, you know, really unpack why uh, the marathon movement really matters. And, um, you know, so I started working on the book shortly after um, our conversation, uh, which happened, you know, the, the last interview happened just within a week of the release of Victory Lap. And, you know, that conversation was edited down to like a five minute YouTube video. Mm -hmm. which is still out there, but <clears throat> I just couldn't stand the thought of all of those gems going on the cutting room floor. So um, when it became clear that it probably was going to be too much of a hassle to convince everybody to do a documentary, I said, well, I can write the book myself. So I started working on the book and, um, you know, three years later, it, it finally came out after tragedy and a lot of adversity, um, you know, the, the book came out and became a New York Times bestseller, which I, I think would have pleased Nipsey. I was going to say some of these stories that, uh, you know, it's funny, we're, we're a men's mental wellness, uh, um, you know, podcast and, and, and talking about an artist like that, um, whose story may have you know, never gone to a grander stage. And, and, and when you have somebody who is willing to stand up to uh, whatever establishment it, might, establishment it might be, whether it's a business establishment like the record industry, something like that, um, whether it's an integrity thing, they're standing up to a government, they're standing up to something where, you know, uh, they're, they're, they're an advocate for the surroundings that they're in. Um, you know, the bravery that's within, you know, uh, Nipsey himself, but, but it, within the hip hop world, um, to do just that right from the very, very beginning to me. And I, we talked about this a little bit before we hit, we, we hit the record button. Um, you know, uh, that's what many times mental wellness is all about. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not allowing those things to go in and get buried, but to actually come out and talk about these things, uh, right. publicly. Um, was Nipsey somebody who felt like there was sort of a higher calling that was, that was involved in the way that he conducted himself? Oh, I think, that is definitely true. He he said it in many records and interviews. You know the the simple phrase "God got me." You know, like I, I might be up against impossible or seemingly impossible odds, but I know God got me. And you know, putting your trust in a higher power absolutely was part of his um, his playbook. And you know, it's. Um, when you talk about like mental wellness and and you know not giving up against you know tremendous setbacks Nipsey's story is like it's like a, a Greek myth or something you know it's unbelievable the things that he absorbed and you know the setbacks that he endured and um, you know really I, I've reflected on this after the book came out and you know it's not easy to write a book I've I've worked on books and I've you know, edited them and collaborated, but to sit and it's all you to have to tell this story and do justice to the story and deliver it to a publisher and get it out there through the edits and everything. It's a big challenge and it brings a lot of pressure and stress. Uh, a lot of it's self-imposed stress because I know that this story means so much to people who care about Nip and then to the people who are just learning about him. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't have had a better subject or a better, you know, coach, if you will. You know, I was listening to Nipsey's voice in my headphones day in and day out. And, um, you know, that steady voice saying, you know, find your pace. Uh, don't trip about how much time it takes. Just make sure you cross the finish line. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a very helpful, uh, you know, message to absorb each day, you know, and um, I, I had to uh, 
kind of will myself to sleep sometimes, you know, because you, you get really wired and you, you don't want to stop, you know, the process of writing something on that scale. Yep. You, you kind of soak up information and then once it's all in your hard drive, you want to get it all down and you have to discipline yourself to actually intentionally say, okay, I have to sleep now. I have to stop and drink some water. I have to do basic things almost like an athlete in training. So um, long story short, Nipsey's book was a book that I thought the world needed, but it was also mm -hmm. the book that I needed to kind of train myself how to do this again, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it felt like uh, something that was ordained, if, if I dare say so. Yeah, no, no, no. I feel that. Like when um, I, I, it's funny because uh, I'm, I'm a financial planner by trade. And I think, you know, we've talked about this on previous episodes, and I think maybe I talked about it with you um, when, we, when we sat at that table. Um, I've never been in a flow state uh, in my financial practice. I have, actually, I shouldn't say that. There are times where I will connect with a client, and it'll be a back and forth thing, and it'll feel like suddenly you're transported out of, uh, of time and place, and nothing really, um, you know, there are no real rules here because we've transcended. We're in a flow state. And, 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 and I mean, it's only happened to me a few times, but the moment I started podcasting, I realized, oh, shit, this is kind of what I'm sort of called to do. Hmm. And when that happens, what you're talking about, when you get into a flow state like that, uh, you have to maintain balance. You have to, you know, like you say, tell you, get yourself uh, an order of events. You know, I got to gotta keep physically fit. I got to eat. I got to sleep. I got to do these things properly because when you get into yeah. a flow state, um, and I'm certain you've probably seen this with a lot of the artists that you've gotten to know over the, over the decades that you've done this. Um, it's such a beautiful thing, though, when you can get into a flow state and do that. Uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you, you sort of started down the path already, was what did you learn about yourself going through this process? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely been a voyage of self-discovery. And, you know, I recently... Um, got one of those Facebook memories um, because it was the sixth anniversary of the release of Victory Lap just passed not too long ago. And so then I got the Facebook memory of the day that we did the interview and it popped up and I realized that I was probably like 60, 70 pounds heavier at the time. And I was, you know, just not taking care of myself. And, um, you know, it was a combination of things, but I definitely got into another zone of self-care and self-discipline and just prioritizing what was important while working on the book about Nipsey Hussle. And yeah. it was partly because, as I said, the, the wisdom that he was dispensing through these interviews, some that I did and some that other people did, just a steady diet of that kind of uh, thinking was really, you know, therapeutic for me. Um, and then the other part of it was just being responsible for your own survival, you know, being self-employed, yeah. um, yeah. you know, not having a, a predictable, uh, you know, paycheck or, you know, any other kind of external structure in my life. It was all, you know, my responsibility to make sure that the, the book was done well and it was you know put out under the business terms with the publisher and you know that everything worked according to plan so mm -hmm. you know i'm very grateful that this process allowed me to kind of take greater responsibility just for my own existence and um you know if if that's something that readers can also tap into then so much the better you know there's a lot of different levels that Nipsey Hussle fans, you know, have been motivated by him. A lot of athletes yeah. uh, have, you know, sworn by his messages. You know, the whole idea of a marathon, you know, it's a, it's a foot race, but it's also a metaphor for just the ultimate test of endurance, mental, physical, spiritual, and overcoming, you know, insurmountable odds to, you know, achieve your goal to do something and to do something different and just, yeah. And to be, and to be who you were meant to be, you know, whatever that, whatever that means. Um, yeah. and there's a legion of, 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 in particular, because of this is focused on men, there's a legion of men out there who are in that place where they've never kind of even given themselves that, 
conversation to wake up to try and figure out you know who you are instead of just living life by connecting the dots or, or, mm-hmm. or whatnot and uh and it's stories like this that inspire us to do so i want to go back a little bit to talk uh, to catch uh, people up who might might not have heard of who you are and your journey so i kind of want to do um this next question uh, uh to kind of bring up some of the things that you have done in your life uh, you've had an extremely interesting uh, if you're if you're to look at the the CV, things that you have done in your life, you've got a lot of very interesting things on there, going all the way back to being a DJ. I want to ask you about that in a minute here, but but the question is is something that you alluded to. Um, you know, you have seen as part of your professional life certainly, but as you'll be able to tell very very quickly with Rob, his professional and his personal life are uh, and interests are, are are very much intertwined with each yeah, other. That's uh, true. You got a guy who've been able to, who's been gifted the, the 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 present from the universe of being able to actually monetize the thing that he is very very interested in and the thing that he is par- a part of from the start. Um, but you have seen the rise and fall. So we talk about you know you were in the magazine business. Well, we've seen kind of magazines kind of hit their peak as to what circulations and whatnot, and then we've seen the entire industry change. Let's go a little step further. Uh, not just that, you've seen hip hop, you were part of hip hop in its earlier, earlier stages, <laughs> DJ and all the other things that you've done. I wanna talk about that. You've seen that grow and grow and grow and turn into this worldwide phenomenon that drives, in many respects, drives pop culture. But at the same time, the music business, you saw it rise to its zenith and then completely change too. All the while, professionally, you're trying to reinvent yourself and, like you said, figure out a way for self-employment. How do I, how do I find my way in this when these industries around me have risen and then fallen, all of that stuff? You think about Vibe magazine. You were there. Quincy Jones, the whole, the whole nine yards from the very, very, very beginning and then – uh, to where it's at. So, so if you wouldn't mind, if we could do a little bit of a timeline and then get into how did you react when some of these things changed the way they did, both for the growth and then for the uh, for the for the, for the remix, if if uh, for lack of a better term, afterwards. Yeah, yeah it, I mean, thank you for that um, summation of my journey. I mean, certainly. Is it right? Was I was I bang on? It's a on little. That? It it's of... a little. You know, there's some things to to, to adjust. I mean, yeah. Quincy, what did I miss? Quincy Jones, of course, is an OG whose story. You know, I was not there from the beginning for him. He was not for him. No band no, no. leader. You know, with Count Basie and you know producing with Frank Sinatra and 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 you know I was listening to his album uh, with Michael Jackson Thriller when I was still in high school. Absolutely. But, um, you know, just to cross paths with a legend like that was like one of the things that I still can't believe how fortunate I have been in life. And, you know, Quincy also blessed me with an endorsement of the Nipsey Hussle book, which, you know, to be quite honest with you, um, you know, apart from just how important that book was to me, it's it's helpful to have Quincy's sort of cloak of protection around you when you enter something as high stakes as that book is. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, my my story um, has definitely lasted a while now, and you know, as you mentioned, the the passion for music has been there all along. Um, and you know, DJing at the time that I was doing it involved vinyl records and needles and turntables not laptops and and software (laughs) um so you know it also involved like carrying heavy crates milk crates of 12 inches and 45s and you know it was a a whole different type of thing and you had to keep your keep your vinyl clean and skip free and you know there was it was a physical act and not just a a mental one um Mm -hmm. but i you know, the love of music has been the thing that's guided me through my entire life. And I think some of my earliest memories were sneaking into my big brother's bedroom and, you know, going through his record collection and putting a needle on a turntable and listening to, to songs. And I've always found that to be just a thrill. It's like lighting the fuse on a bomb when that needle hits the, the groove and you wait for the first drum roll or the first sound of the music. And so I've never lost the thrill of that. And I'm, I feel sorry for people whose experience of music is now through streaming because I just think it's like 
paying the water bill, you know, you just kind of, you know, it's an automatic debit on your credit card and, and you click something on your phone and, you know, that, that thrill of like finding a record that you've heard about but never could find or that nobody else has. And, you know, certainly as a DJ to play a record that makes everybody go, <laughs> what the hell is that? You know, that is a rare thrill. And especially when you see it move a group of people and, you know, that is a, an electric shock that you never get bored with. Um, so, you know, I've seen DJing change a lot and I do DJ a little bit now, but I don't do it in the way that's convenient now. I, I you know, if I do it, I'm going to bring out my records and I'm going to, you know, have to have some actual phonographs, of, you know, and so it's, Few and far between. I don't DJ all the time um, yep. like, like I used to, but um, that love of music has been there throughout. And you know, as a music journalist, it's driven by the same uh, the same motivation. I just had a, an amazing week this past week. Well, actually, last uh, last week, there was this um, conference of hip hop journalists at Columbia University uh, that was put together by one of my former colleagues at Vibe. Elizabeth Mendez Berry and um, a writer who I edited it by uh, Jelani Cobb, who's now dean of the School of Journalism at Columbia, and um, both of them felt like you know the Hip Hop 50 celebration had covered yeah. all the different aspects of hip hop, or many of them, you know, from the MCs, the DJs, the different regions of music, the you know b-boying and graffiti, mm -hmm. a lot of different. Um, aspects of hip hop that were celebrated, but the hip hop journalism wasn't really addressed. And so I had this amazing experience. It was like a big family reunion of, you know, friends and mentors and people you looked up to and people you were rivals with that kind of motivated you to step up your game. And all all these people who were part of the the era of music journalism that I was a part of. You know, Vibe launched in 1992. Yeah. I had the opportunity to be part of the test issue in the very beginning of that magazine. And at the time, there was a couple other places that were writing about hip hop. The Source was our main yeah. competition, I guess, you know, although they were doing something different in that it was all rap. And we were, you know, rap and hip hop. So DJing, you know, the four elements of hip hop in, in the most sort of, you know, hardcore uh definition of that culture vibe was looking at the whole world through the hip-hop uh perspective so quincy right. quincy jones's great uh idea was that hip-hop was a cultural revolution and much the way that rock and roll had rolling stone there needed to be a magazine that was going to look at hip-hop uh you know politics through hip-hop lens uh you know fashion and film and art and all the different aspects of culture and R&B, you know, uh, so at Vibe we did covers on people like Prince and George Clinton and Whitney mm -hmm. Houston and, you know, TLC and, you know, a whole generation of, of music and culture that was inspired by hip hop. So anyway, yep. at this conference, we I was reminded that what we were doing in the early 90s um, and looking up to people like Nelson George and Greg Tate who were doing things at the Village Voice and um, you know there were there were certainly people before us but there was a there was a big groundswell in the early 90s and we were all not only just you know trying to run a magazine and sell magazines we were trying to defend and uplift a culture that we love you know hmm. so our motivation there was a was, much bigger vision to what it was that you were doing it wasn't even so much the what you were doing it was the why you were doing it for exactly and yep. you know in order to do that on the scale that vibe was doing it as quincy jones certainly could tell you um you know it involved you know you had to interact with people that maybe weren't motivated in the same way that you were you needed to you know we were part of time Inc. ventures we were part of a major publishing company that was putting out, you know, Sports Illustrated and, you know, Time Magazine and, uh, you know, dozens of other publications. Um, but, you know, everybody on the editorial team at Vibe was there because we believed passionately hip-hop was not being properly 
appreciated or represented and it needed to be embraced more and it needed to be bigger and uh, you know the full impact of this cultural revolution had to be really properly documented something yes. was happening that was going to you know depend on the story being told properly and i think vibe really changed the world's popular culture you know we we made hip hop enter the mainstream and yeah. um, you know of course it wasn't just the magazine that did that but without a, a, a really well done glossy major monthly magazine putting Snoop and Puffy and you know uh, Queen Latifah and all the great Lauren Hill all the great uh, creators um, on the, the front cover of a magazine and saying you know this is here to stay this is changing the world I'm not sure it would have had the full impact that it had so you know we really believed in what we were doing we we argued passionately about every creative decision and we had rivals that you know were coming for us every month and yep. you know it was a whole moment that I you know I realize now was just you know a, a very rare privilege and a, a you know a great adventure of my life you know and, and that's why I stayed there I never left vibe you know when when we launched in uh, so the test issue was 1992 I wrote a, a feature story in that um, yep. at the time I was editor-in-chief of an art magazine and I was DJing and working in a record shop but you know when vibe said we're launching full-time after the test issue was successful yeah, I, I quit my editor in chief job. I went to Vibe '93, and I stayed there for 17 years, which just you know that's not done in publishing no. usually, you know. Um, and it's just because I couldn't imagine another uh, another job that would be as fulfilling as that, you know. And and um, it really wasn't a job to me. It was a passion and it was a mission. And you know, I. I look on that as, you know, some of the best times of my life. And, you know, the people who I met have gone on to do other things in in the creative fields. And, you know, we keep connecting and, you know, finding new cool stuff to do together. So, you know, those finding were... Finding your way as everything yeah. has changed. Um, I got right. to go back and ask that question. DJ and journalist, those two things you don't necessarily think are going to combine with each other. Is that just who Rob is? Were you just kind of, uh, you know, just wired that way out of the box where it's like, yes, I've got this skill and desire and I love DJing. I love everything about it. I love being part of this culture, um, you know, the mixtape culture and watching hip hop grow. That, that, that's what I love doing. But I also, as I was growing up, knew I had a penchant for uh, being able to ask questions and then write about the answer and write maybe commentary on top of that as well. Are those things that just out of the box were just you? Yeah, very much. I'm, my wow. father uh, was an English professor, and so I grew up a professor brat. It's like an army brat, but you yeah. know, we traveled to different places where he was teaching. or You got to go to the school he was at. Yeah, or whatever city in the world he was on sabbatical, or, you know, so I... I got to see different places in the world and I also just grew up surrounded by books and you know we had like the refrigerator magnet poems and you know it was just like the the caring about writing caring about ideas and all of that stuff is something I learned at the kitchen table and so yeah it was definitely my my thought through you know working on the high school paper and the school yearbook and you know all that stuff i i thought i would eventually write for rolling stone that was the closest thing that i could envision yeah but by the time i was out of college and out there trying to get a job um i actually had an interview with jan wenner who wanted me to work for men's journal and i just like no that's not that's not what i'm here for you know so um, I was really happy when I heard that Quincy Jones was starting a, a magazine uh, about hip hop because actually, you know, reggae and dancehall and hip hop, which were kind of all mixing together in New York in the mm -hmm. late 80s, was what my passion was. And I wanted to bring that to whatever platform I could bring it to. And um, yeah, so once I heard about Vibe, I just started bombarding them with letters. And this was not emails, this was 
you yeah. Know, oh yeah. Envelopes and stamps and yeah. putting them in the mail. Um, and eventually they, they assigned me that story and, and I never looked back. You know, you think about, you, you mentioned Rolling Stone a couple of times and, 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 um, you know, I don't know if Hunter S. Thompson's one of those guys who, who, who made an impact on you. I certainly appreciate, uh, the point of view that he was coming from at the time that he was coming from. And it, it occurs to me, um, the point of view you were coming from at the time that you came from it, it kind of, and I mean, nobody wants to ever compare themselves or hear themselves compared to someone like Hunter Thompson, but, but from a, from a, from a sensibility standpoint, it seems like that's kind kind of where the crosshairs of life kind of threw you um you know you you were you were deeply immersed in this culture while it was growing real time and you actually had the opportunity back in a time and again i want to go back in journalism at that point the goal was always to be um, you know, kind of judgment free of things. You kind of report things as to how they are. If there's mm. an impact being made, you report that impact, but you don't really put personal bias or slants or anything on it. That was a, that was a real uh, hallmark of journalism back then compared to where it is now. I, I'm fascinated to know. So, so I'd love to hear you kind of comment on that, but, but I'm fascinated also to know just what your take is on journalism now and how it seems like even your local nightly news reporter now has an opinion or, or a commentator now has an opinion on things right. that must make the hair on the back of your neck go up a little bit. <laughs> well, I think it's dishonest to pretend that we don't have opinions and for sure it's better to be upfront about what your bias is and let the audience make their choices but the problem that we're living through right now which is a very serious problem is that we can't even agree on the basic facts you know the 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 the, the idea of fake news and alternative facts and living inside an algorithm bubble is a really pervasive problem that you know is is kind of becoming an existential threat you know as we move up to the November 2024 election, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really concerned about that. And, you know, not only in America, you know, we, we see... It's everywhere. Uh, yeah, Gaza and Israel, um, Ukraine and Russia, you know, both sides have completely different versions of the truth. And it's not just that they disagree on decisions, but just the basic language that you use to describe what's happening is completely, it's like two different planets that people are living on even though they're living side by side so that's a mm -hmm. dangerous state of affairs um mm -hmm. but having said that my idea of journalism is definitely not sort of ap wire objectivity i was a fan of yeah thompson um you know people like greg tate people like tom wolf i, th I think the rolling oh, yeah. stone model of of you know what became known as the new journalism you know um, mm -hmm. where it's rigorous reporting and factually accurate stories but told by a very opinionated and and stylish uh, correspondent who is writing in a way that you know brings the reader into the room and you know brings everything to life and gives a kind of cinematic sweep of detail and and makes it as vivid an experience for the reader as possible that's what i aspire to do with my writing and and that's the kind of writing i like to read um and i just again i think it's dishonest to pretend that anyone is actually objective um, so yeah but i think if there's one sort of paragon of the type of writing that you know vibe was you know, patterned after it would have to be Greg Tate, the late great Greg Tate, who, yep. if you've read his book, um, the Flyboy and the Buttermilk, that kind of sums up, that's you know, the essential text for, uh, you know, it's, it's basically a collection of mostly essays from the Village Voice. Um, but, you know, when you look at the very first issue of Vibe, that test issue in which I wrote one feature uh, about the dance hall star Supercat, <laughs> um, the very first page of of that issue was an essay by Greg Tate called The Sound and the Fury, and it was written just shortly after the uh, Rodney King L.A. uprising, and um, it was a just a you know a lightning bolt of um, powerful prose and ideas, and you know saying what needed to be said at 
the moment it needed to be said and you know on a major platform that you know i I, it it is really um i said before like quincy was a master of like you know partnering with people that maybe um you know he is still a master of partnering with people that maybe they don't fully understand his his vision but you know he's able to convince them to rock and ride uh ride along with him and you know the people at time inc I don't think all of them were fully on board with everything that, that the writers at Vibe were, were expressing or the artists that we were putting on the cover were expressing. I remember there was a, there was a um, copy editor uh, who was like a, a career timing copy editor who was just helping us work on the pages of the first issue that I was on staff for. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, she's an older white lady, and I remember she brought me some page proofs with her copy edits on them and she just seemed bewildered by what she was reading and she said to me you know do hip-hop fans read um and you know these are the kinds of preconceived notions that we were contending with these are people helping us put the magazine together you know but you know we had enough creative control that we could say yes they do and we're gonna tell the stories that need to be told in the way they're supposed to be told and the writer's voice and integrity is going to be respected and the artist's visions are going to be you know not just completely rubber stamped you know we were we were critics cultural critics as well as um we weren't just like publicists you know we were Mm -hmm. wrestling with these ideas and and it wasn't just all purple prose and promotion but we believed that this was important uh an important conversation to have and um we certainly knew the hip hop artists and uh, had important things to say and that their fans were going to read what they had to say uh that, you bring up a really cool uh, part again this is this is putting from black and white into color exactly what it is that you got to see you got to see hip hop become legitimate in so many ways and you got to see some of these um these 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 major turning points in the culture and you guys helped to lead the charge and kind of dissect and 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 uh and document what was happening when it happened uh you brought up the rodney king um you know uh the the riots that ensued after the rodney king verdict things like that um what were some of the moments early on in hip-hop where you realized you know i i imagine being so close to it uh sometimes it's hard to kind of zoom out and see some of these bigger world things that are happening were there any major moments early on where you realized okay this isn't just uh a subculture. This is a culture that's coming to dominate. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure you would have seen some of the tea leaves earlier on. Were there some moments, some uh, uh, an artist themselves that came along where you said, "Okay, this is this is a game changer here." Early on. Well, yeah. I, I mean, the first thing I just want to say to be clear, like we didn't make hip hop legitimate. Hip hop was a powerful force, and what we did was we recognized and put it in the mainstream. We we yes. put it on magazine stands around the country. And the source was doing it to an extent too, but I think sure. we brought a level of photography and literary quality of the journalism and a, a breadth of scope that just kind of said Hip hop is here to stay, and it's going to change everything. And we, we were the first magazine to endorse Obama for president. You know, um, so these are changes in American culture that you know have a lasting effect. But for me, I guess the the artists that I got to see up close the most in my early years in New York, because I moved to New York in 1987 after mm-hmm. leaving Chicago, I went to the University of Chicago. I was going to like house clubs and reggae clubs and hip-hop parties there was a great hip-hop radio station at ufc in the 80s um but when i came to new york i was beginning to dj uh a lot of reggae parties and krs1 used to come to our shows um you know boogie down productions being one of the most important you know late 80s um hip-hop acts and you know what they did with um production and the messaging and you know Karis one his uh name is an acronym for knowledge reigns supreme over nearly everyone and you know seeing him do his thing up close he's one of the most powerful live performers ever still to this day and i got to like 
DJ for him, and he at times would hand me the microphone to say a rhyme. And, you know, these are things that don't leave you, you know. So that was mm -hmm. a game changer for me. I was like, wow, this, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm now participating in this thing that I first saw as a, you know, a high school kid in Baltimore. I was not born in the South Bronx. I'm, you know, a white kid that was going to uh, all boys high school in Baltimore. And one of our, one of our teachers there for the, he was like the video techniques teacher. He, he taught a class in video production mm -hmm. and he directed some of the first hip hop videos. He directed, um, sure Hill gang Apache video. So the first time Holy I saw shit. that I was in, <laughs> I was in, you know, my library at, at St. Paul's school in, in Baltimore and, you know, watching Sugar Hill Gang, I was like, what the hell is this, you know? And so for me to go from that to, you know, go through college, you know, loving music, getting out in the streets of Chicago while I did my, my coursework as an English major, yeah. to now living in New York, DJing, working in a record shop, and like seeing Karis One right in front of me and, you know, participating in that. It was a electrifying thing and um you know i realize now that that was the turning point for me um Karis, you know <laughs> i saw him recently you know around the hip-hop 50 celebrations and when i interviewed yeah. him he, he was like yeah you know you're an mc i pass you the mic and you know like for Karis one to say that yeah. is, <laughs> you know pretty crazy you know and then you know he he also did, I don't know if you're familiar with this series Versus, which was a great, like, uh, during the pandemic, um, there was an Instagram Live phenomenon called Versus that was first started by Swizz Beats and Timbaland, where they were, people couldn't go out, people couldn't go do things um, in real time, so they started playing songs back and forth on Instagram Live. The other big pandemic lifesaver was D-Nice Club Quarantine, who was actually, D-Nice was Karis One's DJ. Um, and, and, you know, an, uh, an MC from Boogie Down Productions as well. But D-Nice was spinning on Instagram Live, and it got up to where, you know, there was hundreds of thousands of people, and, you know, it became this phenomenon. So anyway, uh, Karis One did Versus, and I saw him rocking the Barclays Center um, after Versus became a post-pandemic, like, live show event. Yep. And, you know, there's never been anyone more impactful still. You know, this is decades after I first saw him do his thing. He still just commanded the whole arena. So, you know, that was a great thrill to to see Karis one doing his thing and have any small part in, in what he was putting down. But by the time yeah. Vibe launched, that's 1992, yep. Rodney King, you know, L.A. Uprising had taken place. And, and, and the album The Chronic, uh, that Dr. Dre and Snoop pretty much brought, you know, L.A. gangster rap to MTV. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that album was made during the uprising. So there are skits on that album that are actually recorded in the streets of L.A. while the city was burning. <clears throat> and, um, you know, so that was a, a further, you know, proof that, um, you know, hip hop is, as it's been called by many people, you know, the CNN of the streets and, yeah. uh, you know, so having a media platform that was dedicated to reflecting hip hop and translating it to the mainstream was a big responsibility. And it's one that we took very seriously. Uh, you bring up responsibility. I, I, I'm so glad you did because I'm super curious, you know, you have all these different elements of of the hip-hop culture and and um some artists you know you got your krs ones you got your chuck d's you've got your you know these these the message is everything mm -hmm. and 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 there's uh you talk about responsibility that they that they feel like i look at like like public enemy's last album that just came out um you know if, what you're gonna do if the grid goes down and 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 the concepts that are in that album uh some of them are pretty they're pretty heavy um 
I'm super curious, but then you've got the other elements as well, the, the exaggeration, the, 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 the egoic, uh, hyper egoic uh, messages of hip hop and all of that, all put down to amazing beats and amazing sounds and, and all of these things. And, and the world is so gigantic and it's so big. I'm super curious, just from your for your perspective, uh, because it's a fascinating one, um, and 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 highly, highly, highly educated as well. Does a hip hop artist have responsibility? Is that outside of the box, just simply because of the medium uh, as to what it is itself, or is it so big now that uh, anything and everything is 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 permissible? Uh, I I think that you have to make a distinction between rappers and rap Great. music yep. and yep. and then hip hop as a culture and yep. and what I think KRS one would describe as an MC, you know, which is just a little bit more uh, woven into a community and a culture. You know, the rap industry very quickly uh, you know, exploded and learned how to monetize the popularity of rap music, which is like an element of, of hip hop culture. Um, and, you know, we've seen an increasing trend of kind of, you know, exploitive, um, you know, very toxic kinds of, of expression that are like amplified and boosted by the algorithm and by the industry. And, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately, um, you know, during the time that I was at Vibe, you know, we saw two of the greatest minds of our generation lost to violence, you know, um, Biggie and Tupac mm -hmm. died within nine months of each other and they were both, um, you know, victims of violence that, you know, was most likely related to, you know, uh, industry uh, rivalry and, and beef that, you know, really didn't have to go that way. And mm -hmm. I think the, the massive uh, profits of that you know, the, the hype around that. And, you know, I, I've, I've seen a trend since then of more and more kind of, you know, marketing of, of pain and death as a form of entertainment. And, um, you know, that is completely uh, anathema to what I understand hip hop to be about, which is about, you know, um, you know, resolving conflict and you know you have rivalry you have ego all that is is very healthy and real but um you know when it becomes like you know how extreme can we you know whip people up on on an instagram yeah you know feed and you know and, and it has real life consequences and people have yeah. you know too many people have lost their lives behind like you know foolish things that were exploited for entertainment value. And, um, yeah. you know, I think that part of it is really regrettable. And um, so, yeah, there's a huge responsibility. When you have a microphone in your hand, you have a, an audience that's listening. You have to know what you're saying. And um, it doesn't mean that, you know, Karis won, you know, I mean, look at those album covers from Boogie Down Productions, Criminal Minded. He's got, you know hand grenades and, and nine millimeters sitting mm -hmm. around. And, you know, that was a part of his reality and it's something he expressed through his, his rhyme and battling other MCs and, you know, sometimes having physical conflicts, you know, all of that was, was real. I just draw a line between that and um, a situation where someone is just trying to, you know, portray a toxic caricature through music and they're being like amplified by the industry to mm -hmm. you know make those things um you know to monetize that and you know it, it leads to real real people losing their lives or real injuries and you know criminal consequences all kinds of stuff and you know so that's not hip-hop that's mm -hmm. that's the the music industry uh you know exploiting rap uh artists you know or people that want to be rap artists that are unfortunately getting caught up in in something i wanted to ask you about that because i, I kind of 
I, I, I imagined what your answer would be. Of course, it's way more eloquent than you know what my uh, caveman mind would have thought. It's exactly right, and that's you've just summed up what uh, what vibe was doing. It was protecting this and 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 and, and uh, you know this amazing uh, cultural movement that was happening right in front of our eyes. That now, in my opinion, dominates our culture. It's 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 in everything. There isn't. I I I, I went to the mall the other day. Um, knowing that this conversation was going to happen, uh -huh. and uh, and a couple other ones that I that I have going on, and I was looking around at some of the different stores just to see all of the uh, elements of of, of hip hop that influenced, and every single store has it. There isn't one. There wasn't. There wasn't one place in that shopping mall that wasn't uh, influenced, and and it's so big that people can't even understand. Country music now is. 100% influenced by hip hop, you know, and, and you think that these are two genres that, that, that could be nothing more than a big apart. Well, no, they're not. It's, it's not like that. You look at, you know, Beyonce just putting out a, a, a country album right now too, you know, things like that. Um, it's everywhere and it's huge. And the responsibility that you guys took in how we reported on things, how we, um, uh, you know, as a society, uh, uh, like you said, there was maybe a viewpoint that was there, but the documentation of it though, taking it seriously the way that you guys did. It was such a such an important thing that you were a part of at the time, Rob. And I know that you know that, and I know you take it very, very seriously. Um, I'm curious as to what you, if you were to read the tea leaves of the future uh, of, of, of things, what are some of the things that are out there that uh, excite you? And, I mean, you've talked about a couple of the things that have, that have scared the hell out of you when it comes to journalism and things yeah. like that. Uh, what are some of the things that you see that, uh, that you like? Well, I think the Beyonce country album is really a great opportunity to have a conversation about, you know, American culture and where it comes from. You know, country music, you know, like an instrument, an instrument like the banjo, you know, that came from Africa, you know. And so there's things that people assume because of the way that we've been presented, you know, a, a product by, you know, the culture industry. And we don't really always know the history and the roots of these things. So, you know, country music is not uh, all, you know, music made by white people. And it really, you know, it's, a, it's another strand of the blues, really. And, you know, it's all related to African-American culture. Like most of American culture is blended together, you know, all the, the it's background. It's a melting pot. Yeah. So... Um, Beyonce making an album of country music, I think, is a really great opportunity to have those kinds of conversations. Um, and, you know, we, we had uh, headlines about, you know, hip hop isn't having as many number one albums as it has in the past. And, you know, is hip hop falling off? But I think it's more the case of what you said earlier that, you know, hip hop uh, production techniques. Uh, rapping, remixing, just the, the texture of certain drums and, and bass, you know, is is now really pop music. And so, you know, when a pop record comes out, you're really dealing with the sonics that were pioneered through through hip hop. And so it is fully pervasive and um what am I excited about? I'm I'm always excited about the, the next artists that I've never heard of and you know the next mm. um you know creative breakthrough that um uh, actually I was I was recently um speaking with RZA from you know the kind of the godfather the brain uh you know there's there's nine brains in Wu-Tang Clan I was gonna but, say the Wu-Tang uh, yeah but one the, of the RZA <laughs> is the chess yeah, master that, you know yep. He, yep. he was the producer and kind of had the vision of you know yep. creating this uh fully autonomous uh, group of nine MCs that would all get their own solo deals and you know from a business <laughs> and a spiritual perspective he's really probably one of the indispensable geniuses of, of the Wu-Tang phenomenon. So anyway, yeah. I was speaking with him. Uh, he had just received a um, innovation award at the National Association of Music Merchants Convention, which is called NAM. It's this big uh, organization that goes back way before the Recording Academy, actually. Um, they've been doing oh, wow. it for a long time. And um, so we were talking, I was interviewing him about 
the moment when Wu Tang lost their only Grammy nomination, which was for um, the Wu Tang Forever album, and they lost to Puffy. And there was a famous moment when Old Dirty Bastard rushed on the stage and said, "You know, Puffy is good, but Wu Tang is the best. Wu Tang is for the children." And <laughs> you know, this was before Kanye did his thing where he interrupted yep. Taylor Swift. You know, this was just pure passion of, of Old Dirty Bastard saying, <laughs> you know, Wu-Tang is for the children. And everybody laughed at that statement. And, you know, he went on Howard Stern the next day and Howard was cracking up telling, you know, everybody, you know, ODB is here and he says Wu-Tang is for the children. But I, I really felt like he meant that, you know. And yeah. so I was asking Rizzo what did that mean to him. And I did a story about it which is on gq if you want to check it out but basically mm -hmm. he was saying that you know we really did he did mean that and i can speak you know risen and odb are, are family as well as being in the same group and he said i'm pretty sure you know he can't speak for himself now but i'm pretty sure i can tell you what he meant was that he feel he felt like a child following the ethos of wu-tang and what our values are, would be better off than following another path that was like just step on anybody to get rich you know um, mm. that there was this all for one one for all uh, you know principle at work within Wu-Tang that you know he believed would help um, you know someone better than you know following another path that you know he, he got into a lot of detail about that but um, I say that to say that, you know, I'm excited about Riz's next project, um, which, you know, I hadn't heard that he did this, but he actually composed and, and you know, produced a symphonic work um, that he did with a symphony orchestra um, that I haven't heard it yet. Uh, it's called A Ballet Through the Mud. Um, and... You know, I, I can't wait to to experience that. You know, um, that that's something I'm excited about. But yeah, for me, yeah, you know, I'm I'm now you know in my 50s, and you know, I I still listen to the 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 newest you know SoundCloud rapper. You know, I try to always take a certain amount of time every week to you know listen to things that I've never heard of before and, and you know, I, I stumble on things all the time and it, you know, are exciting. Um, and it, there's an artist who we interviewed early on at Mass Appeal, which was after Vibe Folded. Yep. I moved on to other places like Complex and Mass Appeal. Um, and, you know, Mass Appeal um, had a lot of, you know, cool young artists coming through and I was interviewing Almost every other day I was interviewing a, a, another rapper, some of whom I just learned about their music maybe that week. And um, an artist named Corday came through at that time, um, C-O-R-D-A-E, if you're not familiar with him. Okay. He's really, really special, and uh, I'm excited about all the things that he's doing. So listen out for him. Um, I hate that hours disappear when we do this but it's already it's already happening here one of the things i love about uh about the hustle book is at the end of it you don't just leave it as a sum up you go through and you create discussion points yeah and you ask yeah. all these questions and the thing i love like like if you talk about any nerd of any specific culture it could be a star wars nerd it could be a, a lord of the rings nerd it could be a, a music nerd and, and and the thing that um I agree with you wholeheartedly about something you said earlier. I remember the record record store or music store culture, mm -hmm. and 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 I would go to uh, my local HMV, and then there was an independent shop called CD McGee's. All of the staff knew who I was. I got discounts for buying because I bought so much stuff back then. And you go in there, um, and and you you come out an hour, hour and a half later, because you've just had this amazing stimulating conversation about music with people. And, and, and what would happen if this person worked with this person? And what about this with that? And these collaborations and these sorts of things. And it's discussion points. It's jumping off points where, where, where we're music nerds. They just go just like, and, and, and they talk about things and you kind of finish 
the book with a bunch of discussion points mm -hmm. for Nipsey. And I thought that was genius. I, I, I really, really uh, dig that very, very much. Um, I've got a I've got a softball question for the end that I'm just oh, curious about sure. just my own thing. But but one of Nipsey's favorite quotes was uh, the highest human act is to inspire. Mm -hmm. You know, what part of his life story inspires you the most? Great question. Great way to get these amazing words uh, through the idea of people that now creating some self-examination. Um, I love that you did that. I thought it was really cool. It goes back to that responsibility piece. You know, this is a, an entertaining mm. Uh, book, um, insightful book, all of these things looking at this story, but you wanted to take it and immediately get some introspection. Plus you have like, you know, a couple more dozen little discussion points that are, that, that are there. That's just the first one that I went through. Um, I talked, I asked earlier what inspires you. You talked about KRS, that makes the KRS one, that makes sense. Um, what else inspires you? What are some of the things that, that, that just, uh, that make you want to wake up every day and, 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 and hustle and go for it? Um, I mean, the biggest thing for me is just the gift of being alive, you know, that, you know, tomorrow is never promised. And when we, when we reflect on the lives of people who had so much more to give and, you know, their life was taken away in the blink of an eye, I think that's the biggest inspiration for me. You know, think about Nipsey, think about Bob Marley, you know, passing away in his yep. 30s. Think about Biggie and Tupac in their 20s. Um, just yesterday, I heard about a good friend of mine who's a great reggae singer named Peter Morgan from the group Morgan Heritage, um, a, a family group that won a Grammy for Best Reggae Album. And I had no clue that he would lose his life yesterday, but I got that news. And so I just look at it as, um, the, there was a, a quote that somebody told me recently that I've been, I've been repeating, and I don't get it quite right, but it sums up what we're talking about, that, you know, like procrastinating or saying you're not in the mood to do something that day is, it's like the arrogant belief that God owes you another chance to do something tomorrow that you could do today. And, yep. you know, that just is not a, a, a solid foundation to stand on. You can't expect that tomorrow is, is just going to be there for you. And that's also, you know, like um, one of the reasons that, you know, I, I don't drink anymore. You know, I, I'm, these are decisions that I've made because I want to maximize my time um, on earth and I want to, be clear and, and sharp and, you know, be present for everything and, and make the most of every moment. So, you know, it, it, it might sound cliche, but life itself and how fleeting it is, is what inspires me. I, uh, we're ending there cause you can't la stick a landing any better than what you just did. Absolutely. There's no question about that. You brought up people of Gaza. You think about people in, in, in Russia, Ukraine right now, and this isn't assigning any side whatsoever. These are people, uh, where tomorrow is not guaranteed people who right. are living in these places and whatnot. And, 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 and where we become soft many times is the idea that something, Oh, what a great quote. Cause it's not expect like tomorrow, anything could happen, right. you know, from a bus to a biological thing to a, you never know, like anything could happen. And, and the idea that we, uh, many times take for granted, um, that the, 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 the uncertainty, of, of, of life and we think that we, we, we get comfortable and that comfortableness many times leads to some of the mental health stuff that we have going on. Yeah. Um, kudos to you for the sobriety too, for wanting to, you know, have your eyes wide open and, and, and focused as opposed to numbing and, 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 you know, that is an amazing, amazing thing. Um, I know you got stuff in the hopper. Rob, that you can't really talk about some of the yeah. things that you're working on here. Uh, please, please promise me we can continue this relationship and, and, and when you have some stuff to announce that we can help plug, that sort of thing, uh, you would allow us to do that with uh, through the He Changed It channels as well. I would be delighted to continue this combo. There's a lot more that we could delve into and, and yeah, uh, as the new work is coming out, I'd love to, to share it with everybody. 
outstanding. Thank you okay, so much, cool. Rob. Um, this is why we do the show, you know, talking to these different guys about their perspectives or points of view, what they've learned along the way uh, in order of, you know, and he changed it. We have this thing where, where as they're building the app, you know, my wife and her team keep saying, you know, take something that you need, leave something that you know. Hmm. And, and that's how we get better is by doing things like that. Uh, I want to thank Rob Kenner so much for coming on again. Uh, the book is out now. There's all sorts of things that Rob uh, has, has written and done. If you search his name and you want to, you want to go in to see some amazing deep dives, some amazing articles that he has done over the years. Uh, you know, please, please do that. But the book, uh, The Marathon, Don't Stop, The Life and Times of Nipsey Hussle, out now. Uh, been out for a while. Go get it. It's, uh, it's a story that will inspire you. This has been another episode of He Cast, the official podcast of He Changed It. My name is Mike Chisholm. Go change something.